We're going to be showing you some slides um, which will introduce you to Mozambique, um, the history of Mozambique and, and how we um, might understand some of the situations that are, are present even today. Um, the reason for, the, for them uh, being there like that right now. Um, my, as I said, Mark and I met in Mozambique and I was already working there um, in the middle, uh, the thinnest part of Mozambique, um, working with women's groups there. And it was mainly from women and families that had been displaced because of the war that had been going on for quite some time. Now, if you're from the south of Mozambique, you say that the war was there for 16 years. If you're from the north, you know that it was 30 years long because they were fighting in the north coming across the border from Tanzania before, um, uh, before it uh, hit in the south. Um, so Mark and I met in the middle there and he had been working in the south in Maputo. And when we were married, we went up to Nyasa, which is in the north. And so our history and our understanding of Mozambique is seen through the lens of the northerners. So Addison, if you can give me uh, permission to share the screen, we'll, we'll quickly go through a, just a few slides to give you some context. Um, Woody, then, you should be a co-host and uh, able to present your screen. It says host, host disabled participant screen sharing. Oh, let me see what I can do about that. <laughs> and I am, there you are, let's see more. Make a co-host. There we go. There we go. Do you have to click it through? Right. Well, um, as Helen started to talk about, uh, it's a rather complicated story, ours, <laughs> um, but it's been a uh, part of our life. The, yeah, we kind of like that word complicated in it because the Portuguese will lead you to understand it slightly differently. It's complicado. That means with folds to it. And that is the story of Mozambique, that you, it's not just a land that um, Bob Dylan sang about, but it's, it's, <laughs> it's um, got a very complicated history that is um, very regional as well, very regionalized within the country. And they, the different parts of the country have experienced the same history differently. Um, so just an idea about the size. When people say Africa, this is not one place. There's 1.2 billion people in 54 countries speaking more than 4,000 languages. It is the most diverse continent in the world. And you see on the top left in the Western Africa, you see the map of the United States to show you just how big uh, the continent of Africa is. Um, it's also doesn't fit the stereotypes that people often speak about the dark continent. It has the fastest growing population. I believe, Bishop, that your connection has frozen. The fastest growing economies of the world. Uh, twice as many women in Gulfstream Church has grown um, incredibly fast. Uh, now having 44 million Anglicans, the uh, faith tradition that we belong to. There's Mozambique in the uh, eastern corner. Uh, Madagascar is the, seems to be the more famous cousin across in the channel there because of the Disney films. But we, we mirror image it and it probably uh, broke off of the African continent once upon a time. It runs from Tanzania, uh, it, northern border, down to South Africa uh, in the south and borders. Malawi, uh, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and uh, South Africa. And here's a, a map of Mozambique superimposed over the United States just to show you the size of it from, uh, from Michigan to Florida, from Washington DC to St. Louis. 
Uh, it's an enormous uh, country with uh, 29 million people now. We had the northern half of the country uh, was part of the Diocese of Niassa, so pretty much a, a line through the middle of the country. Everything north of that was where we worked. And just to give a little bit of a context, um, uh, Mozambique had uh, contact with Arab traders as early as the ninth century. The, the people of Mozambique originally uh, were um, indigenous uh, people, not Bantus, but uh, local folks who have now all but uh, been eliminated by war and uh, disease, much like uh, Native Americans have. The Bantu people came uh, gradually from West Africa into Southern Africa. And then the Arab traders started to meet along the coast. Slavery uh, existed in Mozambique from very the beginning as nations fought against each other. And we like to call them tribes now, but they were fully nations in their own right uh, throughout Africa. Uh, but slavery was very different in those contexts in that it, a defeated uh, nation, um, the, the people would be absorbed into the community of the victor. There was nothing like the chattel slavery that then uh, takes place later when colonization happens from Europe. And, and the Portuguese arrived in Mozambique in 1498 and spent almost 500 years there. So it's this prolonged uh, contact, they had a unique way of looking at life um, in the colonies, not seeing them as colonies at all, but actually outposts of Portugal. And so this was called, Mozambique was called Portuguese East Africa uh, until its independence. And uh, many uh, Portuguese were sent to inhabit the country being in its later life after the, the great seafaring times, it, it uh, went through a great time of poverty itself. And so many uh, peasants from Portugal were sent out to farm the lands of Mozambique and Angola. And there are stories told of uh, Mozambican uh, workers having to read the mail of their Portuguese shop owners because they were illiterate. And so it was, it was a very different relationship than what happened in say British uh, Africa where the, the British sent out an elite to govern and there was a distance between people. Uh, often in Mozambique, that was not the case. Uh, Mozambican or the Portuguese like to say they did not discriminate because any Mozambican could become Portuguese if they were baptized Roman Catholic, uh, learned to speak Portuguese fluently, and had uh, Western civilized habits. That means they could eat with a knife and a fork and a spoon. Uh, and then you became what was called an assimilado, someone assimilated into the culture. So a long, long period of uh, colonial, and we use the word colonialization rather than uh, colonization. colonization, because it was more than just uh, a physical or governmental imprint, but something that was printed in on the very psyche and being of the people. You have to, when, if you read about the Portuguese in Africa as well, you'll hear about uh, Angola too. And um, it needs to be, understood, I think, that different people, different Portuguese went to either Angola or Mozambique. As Marcus said, it was possibly uh, those needing the land and wanting land that went to Mozambique, but it was the upper classes that went to Angola because of the draw of gold and diamonds and oil that, that, that was being found in Angola. So their histories, although they've been turbulent on both sides, have been on, from a different base, really. The, the transatlantic uh, slave trade is perhaps uh, one of the most desperate uh, histories um, anywhere. And, and, you know, being an American, of course, I knew something about the slave trade from our own culture here. 
but to live in Mozambique, which was the source of slaves, um, it looked very differently. Um, there's a picture, a, a sketching here in the right of how uh, slaves were, were walked from the interior of Africa, in this case, in the middle of Mozambique, to the coast to be slowed, uh, sold. The men had these uh, wooden uh, staves around their necks. They were just cut out of branches with no padding whatsoever. And they had to walk uh, hundreds of miles with these, uh, with these staves around their necks, which caused great sores and, and injury. And, and of course, the uh, death toll was, was enormous. But uh, to this day, these old slave trails, which were footpaths in those days, uh, ha have become the roads going east and west throughout Africa, uh, particularly in Mozambique. And they're all lined with mango trees because the mango was the one fruit that uh, was available easily and slaves were allowed to eat and they'd spick out the pits uh, as they walked and these mango trees sprouted out. So now you have lines and lines of mango trees going east and west across the country, uh, giving testimony to this, this most horrible event. It's it said that up to a million Mozambicans uh, were enslaved. Um, Mozambique sent most of its slaves to uh, the French islands of uh, Réunion and to the Cape of Good Hope where the uh, Dutch uh, East Indian Company was and then to Brazil. Most of the Brazilian uh, slaves uh, who outnumber uh, North American slaves uh, 10 to one by the way there were many, many more slaves sent to South America than there were to North America. Uh, most of them came from Angola, where it is said that one in four of the population was captured and enslaved. But they're also saying that the massive underdevelopment of so, ma so much of Africa, the rural Africa, even today is because of those times when the um, strongest men were mm -hmm. taken and the strongest age group, uh, men and women, were taken and the continent has not yet recovered from that time. The University Missions to Central Africa was a British uh, mission movement that came after David Livingstone's travels through Central Africa, the first bishop, uh, a missionary bishop. So he, had, he was a, a bishop without a church. There were no Christians in Mozambique was sent in 1861 and on the right is his grave site, which we discovered in this tall grass. It was about 14 feet tall and uh, it had been abandoned during the war of destabilization, which we'll talk about shortly. But he came um, with the idea of planting an, a church um, because of Livingston's travels and excitement. Much of Livingston's advice, by the way, turned out to be rather unhelpful, uh, including uh, rivers that were not navigable, like the Zambezi and the Rovuma, uh, which he thought would be, and uh, the, just the hardships of life. Um, so that uh, most of the early missionaries who came out from Britain in this case, died very shortly thereafter, including this uh, Charles Fred, uh, Fred, Frederick Mackenzie, who lasted but a year and died from uh, probably from malaria. There's a story um, told about uh, missionaries coming uh, from Tanzania, walking across the plateau of Nyasa, looking for Lake Malawi or Lake Nyasa as we call it. And on the way they met the king of the Yao people whose name was Mataka. And Mataka was a very forward thinking uh, person was very interested to know what these missionaries were up to and how it might benefit his people. And so he invited them to stay with, with him for many weeks. And they talked about uh, life and what their purpose was. And the missionary said their purpose was to bring education and commerce and civilization and Christianity. And uh, so he wanted, Mataka wanted to hear uh, what all these things 
uh, would offer him. And he was quite interested in the education. He was very interested in the commerce. Civilization, not quite so much. <laughs> the Western manners weren't so interesting. And Christianity, he was appalled by uh, because um, the missionaries clearly spoke out against the slave trade. And so it is an example of uh, probably the worst example of evangelism in the history of the Christian church because after their journey, King Mataka and the entire one million Yao nation converted to Islam uh, because they were worried about uh, what Christianity would mean for their livelihood, which was uh, intermediaries in the slave trade. We, we as Anglicans, uh, the church came out of this history of the UMCA mission. The struggle uh, for independence started in the 1960s, like many places in Africa. Um, this is President Samora Michel, um, whose famous slogan, a luta continua, uh, rang throughout the world. And um, Frilimo, the, the forces de libertação uh, de Mozambique, uh, was the movement that started first in Tanzania and then spread south across the border into Mozambique. And as Helen said, the, the struggle for independence, almost all of the battles were in the north. The south uh, never suffered uh, from this war. Uh, but many of the leaders of the movement came from the south. M Maputo, our capital, is in the very southern tip. And so um, there, there was always this natural kind of geographical and cultural division between North and South. And it uh, was accentuated in the liberation struggle because most of the battles, as I said, took place in the North. Most of the soldiers were Northerners and yet the leadership was all from the South. You have to, when you talk about the struggle for independence and, and then the subsequent war that came after that, um, you have to hold in balance as well what else is going on in the continent, and especially in South Africa, because around this time too, you've got um, a lot of the rising antagonism and activity against um, the apartheid regime down there. And that was influencing uh, Mozambique and, and the other neighboring countries, um, because Mozambique was very supportive of the anti-apartheid campaign and people were coming across the border to to uh, work for the anti-apartheid campaign in Maputo. So some um, you will hear of um, different attacks on buildings in Maputo because of that and also support for the guerrilla movement that happened after independence in Zim Zimbabwe um, it, as a way to as you'll see, to destabilize Mozambique as one of the neighboring and in the beginning of their independence, successful um, new governments in the region. A, a, st a story too about um, this time because um, Mozambique uh, sought assistance from European and Western governments and, and did not receive it. And so it turned uh, to Eastern Europe, of course, this is the time of the Soviet Union. And it was the Soviet Union and uh, the DDR, a democratic uh, of Germany and, uh, and Libya, which provided most of the support for these independent struggles. And this had a huge influence on the thinking of uh, the Mozambican leadership. You can see in the flag, um, it's kind of the, the Marxist symbolism and that, that came from China, Soviet Union, and then um, the support of Libya in training. The churches um, on the whole were, other than the Roman Catholic Church, which was very much yoked with the colonial Portuguese state, uh, were extremely supportive of the struggle for independence. We as Anglicans, for instance, uh, the first bishop of the Diocese of Nyasa uh, was 
also a hero of the independent struggle. He was recruiting soldiers uh, as a priest. Uh, in his pastoral visits, he would recruit uh, soldiers to go with Frilimo, and then, um, but was sold out, captured, imprisoned, and uh, tortured, uh, having both his legs broken. He spent uh, 11 years in uh, prison, finally, finally being released, yeah, in the South, uh, finally being released, but uh, with the promise that he would never return to Northern Mozambique. You have to have in your mind the map that we uh, showed earlier with Tanzania bordering the Northern part of Mozambique, which was into the diocese that we uh, then served. But during this time of uh, the struggle for independence, they suffered immensely with um, the burnt earth um, policy of the Portuguese that happened particularly along the lake shore because they knew that the Anglican church, which was so strong along there, had been involved um, in this, as Mark said, the, uh, the support of um, independence there. So um, lots of men left for employment in neighboring countries. And I remember the second Bishop of, of uh, Nyasa once saying to me, the church exists up there because the women remained in those war years and they they kept all the um uh things of the church in their homes to keep the services going and um that that does come out of another history that 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 is of the mother's union as as it's spoken of in um out of the anglican communion that is very very strong in in mozambique and as it is in africa with i think about four million members um but it was their dedication that, that actually kept their church communities um, alive, really, along the lake shore, as that bishop once told me. As Helen said, uh, for us in the north, uh, the war continued even after independence. There was a brief lull of peace with much excitement. Uh, the new Frilimo government introduced uh, health care for all education for all, things that did not exist under the Portuguese, kind of a barefoot doctor campaign for, for health. Um, and there was just a real tremendous um, joy and sense of hope. Uh, but that was very shortly, you can see just two years later, uh, a second war began. Uh, it's called the War of Destabilization. Outsiders will often call it a civil war. Um, because indeed it was in one sense, um, but it was promoted, uh, funded, supported uh, entirely by the outside. And this is where uh, Helen's reference to uh, apartheid South Africa and uh, Rhodesia, which then becomes Zimbabwe, comes into play because the, the great fear of white South Africa was not of um, uprisings within the country, but of attack from newly independent neighbors like Mozambique. They were afraid that Mozambique, Namibia, Zimbabwe, and Botswana, Angola, all the neighboring frontline nations, as they were called, would attack South Africa. And so they developed this rather sophisticated and horrific a war of destabilization, making use of uh, real grievances within the country, this north and south divide, um, the lack of development in the north, the uh, increasing disparity uh, between investments north and south, uh, all the leadership coming from the south, and religion uh, as tools to recruit people Mozambicans to be involved in this war. Um, it's an interesting thing to, to remember also that the country was so newly independent. And at that stage, they, they believed that there were 21 different language groups in Mozambique. I've heard that more recently, they actually say it's 45 different language groups. So it's always been a very strong policy of the new government to talk about Mozambicans, to, to 
bring together all those different people into one nation. And um, it's interesting because you're used to um, speaking of people as nationally like that. Um, and that's a difference with, with what I found here where we've, we've made it into a racial difference rather than a national difference. I could explain that more later, but we're coming into the years that Mark and I, it's part of our personal history. I went to Zimbabwe in 1984 and uh, worked in a school that was on the border with Mozambique. And then I moved into Mozambique to work there in 1987. And Mark went out in 1987 into Mozambique. So that you'll see that uh, we met in 1990, we got married in 1990, met in 89. So that um, those years of war are very much part of um, what our experience was in those years. Yeah, in, in, in fact, I uh, came to somewhat uh, unfortunate fame um, because I, I was working with the Council of Churches as an agriculturalist. That's my uh, previous training, and uh, was sent up country uh, in southern Mozambique to a place called Inyamban, the town of Homuini, which was considered a safe area to work on seed multiplication. That what had happened is because of the war, much of the food production had uh, had stopped, and farmers were were eating their seed rather than saving it uh, for next year's planting because of hunger. And so this was a, a major program, was funding from uh, USAID to provide first food uh, to, to relieve hunger. But uh, our, our corn, maize, as they call it there, is yellow and soft because uh, it's sweeter, whereas their corn is white and hard. And the white hard corn of, of Africa is much more resistant to drought and insect damage, whereas our yellow maize was not. And, and you know, being creative farmers, when they got all this yellow corn from, from the United States, they saved some to plant because they thought if it came from the US, it must be better than their own. And uh, it, it was disastrous because our corn is all hybrids. I won't go into details of that, but you can't replant a hybrid uh, seed out. It doesn't, doesn't produce. And so they were having even more difficulty. And our project was to find local genetic materials and uh, reproduce them. Unfortunately, eight days after my arrival, uh, the, the town was attacked uh, by this uh, opposition force. They were called Renamo, uh, the resistance uh, to the government. They came in at uh, six o'clock in the morning and just began to uh, shoot indiscriminately into the town and the village. Uh, and the, by the end of the day, over uh, 400 people had been killed and another three or 400 uh, had been taken prisoner to carry away their supplies. And uh, I, as an eyewitness and an American, um, it became the subject of a lot of news, uh, which was uh, a disturbing experience in, in just so many ways, uh, how uh, so many uh, Mozambicans had been killed, but the, the news wanted to know about one American who had survived. Um, it marked uh, my life in a very profound way. And um, the decision to remain in Mozambique after that, um, of course, led to meeting Helen and getting married, and then uh, years of real joy and, and, and pleasure, but with a, with a deep ache and, uh, of this tragedy that I, that I witnessed. And Helen, too, had, has her own stories of, of violence. Well, the picture here is of a child soldier. So um, yes, I was working in, a, uh, in the middle of Mozambique when we met, uh, with different women's groups along on, along the corridor, as they called it. But after we'd married and gone up to Lushinga in Nyasa, our first project was actually to locate children who had been separated from their families because of war activity. 
when Renamo would come and attack a village, burn it, and the, everyone would just scatter. And we were very close to Malawi's refugee camps. So it was, a, it was simply a question of finding families of children that had been uh, located in those camps. And there was also, it, the project was born out of the discovery of child soldiers and the traumatization of them in order to kill their own people and some, sometimes their own families. And uh, so it was a project with Save the Children and through the Christian Council in our part of um, Mozambique. Um, and they said at the time that something like, I think 200,000 children were uh, displaced um, and it's more than a million that had been um, found, uh, uh, men, women and children that had been made refugees out, set out of the country during this war. Some people have called it the killing fields of Africa in relating it to what was happening in, in uh, Southeast Asia. Yeah, and, and as she said, one million refugees three to four million people displaced. I mean, they had left their home because of violence and sought refuge in a different place within the country. So it was almost a, a quarter of the population. The population was only 12 million at the time and it's doubled since, but. Yeah. A quarter of the population yeah. had left their homes. Yeah. And, and this war was, was so diabolical in that it, it sought out weak targets like schools and hospitals, um, you know, innocent, uh, workers who were trying to help people uh, were attacked uh, most frequently. And we go into detail of this because unfortunately this pattern, this cycle, uh, you'll, gets repeated uh, time and time again in the history of Mozambique. But peace came in 1992, the year our firstborn uh, was, was born, and it was the strangest experience um, we had anticipated a great joy and celebration when the peace treaty was finally signed between the two parties in Rome, um, but it was absolute stillness. I remember sitting in our home listening to the radio and peace was announced and we went out into the streets. It was, it was dark. Uh, our town didn't, didn't have electricity very often, um, so it was, it was very dark. And we expected people to come out into the streets in, in celebration, but it was deathly still. And the next day we, we realized, uh, uh, talking to folks, that they had gone through uh, too many false hopes, false dawns, to believe that this one was true, that they would be just pragmatic and wait. And in fact, it took a long time for refugees to come back and people to, to develop again. Uh, just uh, a little bit of an idea of the religious composition of the uh, area where we live. This is not true of the whole of Mozambique. Uh, if you look at the whole of the country, the numbers are 18% um, uh, Muslim, 60% uh, Christian, and then the remainder African traditional religion. That means uh, the local, local beliefs. Uh, but in northern Mozambique, and this is, again, one of the reasons why there was this discrimination. You have a Muslim majority, 60% uh, uh, Muslim and only 26% Christian. In the province of Nyasa, where, where we spent most of our time, uh, one of uh, four provinces in the north, uh, the Anglican church was the largest. But in the rest of the northern uh, part of Mozambique, the Roman Catholic church, was the biggest Christian denomination. Um, I think the if you the history of Mozambique since um, independence and since the end of the wars in ninety two have been cyclical issues with natural disasters which produce violence which produce chronic poverty. And um, the disasters are almost annually flooding that happens in certain places and destroys um, agriculture, um, destroys buildings, um, makes uh, outlying villages be extremely remote and unable to, to um, 
reach, uh, it affects health, the violent, there is a, a historian who, Malin knew it, who wrote about the history of, the written history of Mozambique, which only actually goes back a couple of hundred years if you're looking at written history. And he says, you can see very clearly in there the, um, the, the connection between natural disaster, climate change, and political differences and violence and, and increasing poverty. It's cyclical. And he even put it down to every seven years that the climate would do, would produce this instability that would lead to political violence and increasing suffering. Um, chronic poverty is a term that um, the UN came out with as they were talking about the millennial goals um, and they, they were trying to improve poverty around the world, diminish those millions that live in poverty um, in the majority world. And um, they seem to connect with this chronic poverty where um, education and health means that you might be able to inject a project and money into something specific for a while, but it would not sustain at all and would drop back because of that underlying foundational poverty that is there that, that would not allow um, um, a people to, to move on. So I, I think that chronic poverty is somewhere between 15 and 20% of Mozambique right now. It may have slightly improved in the last few years, but what it means is that um, you will have multiple children because they are your um, social security later. Um, their health is um, secondary to the breadwinner um, who is likely to be the man. Uh, we were involved in different projects throughout our time there, but um, noticing we were very involved in a tree planting project and that it increased the level of um, wealth that was there, but amongst the chronically poor, so that it would be the difference between whether you, you could put a roof on your house or you just had thatch. Um, and it would also mean that um, the breadwinners might become your oldest children, and that meant taking them out of school so that they could go and work um, and, and earn a salary. That it was just a fascinating, um, issue to, to be faced with that, that you would have people employed but and there was a big big um, project at that time to discover what would be needed to employ someone the level they'd need to earn in order to lift their families from COVID, chronic poverty and it would be five times what the minimum salary was at that time meaning that you were you were almost disrupting um, the, 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 as they call it, the mashamba culture, where you have your own field and your own food. I remember once being asked to go and speak to some women because um, some tree saplings had been burnt down. And they said to me, Mum Elena, we would tell you if we knew who had done that because we have given up our mashambas to come and work here. This is our life now. And if this doesn't work, we don't have those fields to go back to. And, and just making decisions like that is um, heartbreaking. Mm. Yeah, life, I mean, is just so precarious. It's, it's hard to overestimate the risk uh, involved in, in just living. In the 1980s, end of the 80s, when we first arrived, life expectancy uh, was only 46 years of age. Uh, one in three children died before the age of five. One in three um, died before the age of five. Mozambique was, according to the UN uh, Human Development Index, was rated to be the third least developed country in the world. Uh, it's only moved up to 10 or 11 now. So um, it was terrible, terrible poverty. Um, and a draining kind of poverty that it was all effort was made just to, to survive. And yet, as we'll say and, and show, there was also incredible life. 
So the Diocese of Nyasa uh, was what became our home um, for uh, a long time. <laughs> and in many ways, uh, we feel still our family. Uh, Helen has a saying, she says she was born in England, but formed in Mozambique. And I think that holds true for me as well. Our, our vision as a diocese was to be a communion of communities transformed by Christ Jesus. And, and this came up um, as an attempt to try to make use of the great diversity the wars um, of the past had made use of diversity to separate and divide people uh, by religion, by tribe, by language, by geography. And, and so we saw as one of our missions as a, as a church was to try to unite uh, people into this communion of communities, uh, regardless of the, the places we came from, the differences we had. Um, that's the church Helen was uh, the, the priest of, uh, Johanna Abdallah. Um, I'll, I'll tell the story of Johanna Abdallah and she can tell you about the church. Johanna Abdallah, uh, you, can, you can hear, it was, doesn't sound like a very uh, Christian name. <laughs> In fact, he was a, a convert, a Yao. Uh, remember that story I told you about the first missionary's failure? Well, uh, Johanna became a Christian as, uh, and he was a nephew of King Mataka. Uh, and uh, he uh, was the product of a very progressive thinking from the mission society in that they wanted to raise up local leaders from the very beginning. And so Johann Dalla was priested in 1896, which is uh, only you know, one generation away from the first visit of a missionary before there was any Christian presence whatsoever. And 30 years later, there was an ordained priest he, he was an amazing man, uh, incredibly uh, gifted uh, intellect, taught himself Hebrew and Greek, and in fact was invited to teach at the uh, college in Jerusalem, the Anglican College of St. George. Um, but he also uh, was a great uh, missionary among his own people and planted churches all around uh, the, the plateau, the, the Nyasa Plateau, riding on a donkey. Uh, he was a, a single man, celibate, never married, and would go from place to place and spend weeks and weeks uh, traveling and visiting people. And this church is dedicated in memory of him. Which is um, a lovely memory for me, uh, a lovely memory um, of community involvement and community support and building this church, um, the foundations had been laid a few years before and then the money had run out and <laughs> various things had happened. And so then um, I was, I had been asked to go and be the priest there for a little while, just to go um, sort out some other issues going on. And then um, a visiting bishop offered us some more uh, support for building this church and that's basically what we had to do in about four months we put a, the roof on we put the walls up the women would come and bring in the stones and um, seriously some days we had um, 50 to 100 people were there volunteering their time the women would bring in their meals from their own their own homes to to um, support the builders in this work. It was just incredible. Um, we had different people that were visiting the center. This was in the diocesan center um, and they would come and join in as well. Um, and then it was opened. Um, and this, this is not the opening, this is Palm Sunday the following year, but on the opening of this church, we had about two and a half, 3,000 people inside this building. And the joy was just hmm. overflowing. And um, I could speak for hours about this church. <laughs> They're wonderful. And the, 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 the number growth uh, was amazing from 20 some thousand, 26, 27,000 members 
of our diocese um, now, or, or when we left over 65, and it's reported that it's probably near to 100,000 members, uh, which would be uh, by far the biggest uh, diocese in the Episcopal Church. Um, and it's, it's grown so much that it is multiplying into three new dioceses, uh, as is Southern Mozambique to become its own province, uh, kind of an uh, administrative unit of the church. The, the reason uh, we think that it grew uh, are many, but one of the, the most important ones was um, that faced with chronic poverty, the first uh, purpose of the church was to work with people to develop their own livelihoods. And that's where we put our energy, not so much in building churches at first, uh, but in developing people. And this sign to the right, which is a little bit uh, hidden by our, our tab, um, you can't see that. <laughs> says, um, go ahead. It's a wonderful sign actually, just to show where the church could be, where any faith community can be embedded in their, their community. It says, welcome to the bar. The happy bar is that, or the first word. Then it says, the Anglican church is this way. The, cent the health center is another way. And, and the school, and then the football club at the bottom, right <laughs> in the middle of society is where the community of faith is um, kind of holding it all together, including everyone that, that would be living there. And I mean, including. In my church in Johanna Abdala, we, we came to a realization with the funerals we were having that actually interfaith was within families, um, a, a reality within families. And when we had a funeral of a family at our church, um, some uh, of uh, the Muslim faith didn't want to come inside because it was a church. So we we built these little shelters from the sun, which were outside so that they could still be part of this service. And it wasn't seen as an unusual thing. Um, I remember being at the hospital for funerals as well, where bodies would be prepared and remembering that these two religions are relatively new, 200 years old in Mozambique, whereas African traditional religion is the glue that is there in so many social events so that preparation for funerals was exactly the same um, because it was really going back to the roots of, of people and understanding of what I came to see as life death, one word, that we are all connected in, in, in the most fundamental way and will continue to be throughout our lives and, and that's important. In fact, it's life-giving. Yeah, a lovely story about, um, you know, Anglicans were a small minority in a, in a Muslim majority land. And so um, it, uh, people, when they got married, often married across religions, because as a young man came to me once and said, Bishop, who, who else can I marry? That's, there are only Muslim girls in my village and my family. And, and so the church, um, 100 years ago, 130 years ago, in its Yao prayer book, which was the language of the group there, um, developed a marriage ceremony whereby a Christian and a Muslim could marry. And the Christian, they would stand on the front porch of the church. The Christian would stand inside the church building and they would hold hands across the, uh, the, the door entrance and uh, the, the Muslim partner would stand on the porch and the service would be held at that place of transition. And so that uh, recognizing the diversity of, of the communities involved. Um, when I look at what we've listed here for the growth there, community development, none of this was ever just directed at the Christian church. Mm. It was the communities. And when, as you've heard from us now, the communities were mixed in so many different ways that that was fascinating time to see that people would all come together. Even the building of Johanna Abdala, I had um, different, it was a community building so that it wasn't just the Christian church that was helping with the building of it.
one of our biggest um, initiatives in rural communities was literacy among women because it was extremely high. And um, we, we had um, an enormous literacy program, but again, Muslim women were uh, unwilling to come inside church buildings, which, which is where they were often held. And so like Johanna Abdallah, the, uh, these little shade uh, thatched uh, huts were built outdoors and the literacy circles met there. And literacy was transformative. Uh, it gave dignity to women, but interestingly, it also improved uh, health because women are the primary caregivers of children. As a woman learned to read and write, uh, she also learned more about healthcare and uh, preventative healthcare particularly, and life expectancy increased among the family just by learning to read and write. It's very hard to separate out um, community development, um, dignity for people, it, for everyone, and not think of other issues that affect that. And I would say that um, climate and clean water um, and the use of land was, was vital to all of the things that I just mentioned. When we very first went, when, when Mark was the bishop, we, were, we went up the lake shore and some women were very upset because their dug well had just caved in and that meant there was no clean water for bathing and um, the morning cup of tea. And mm -hmm. actually from that conversation, we went ahead with over the years, I think there's something like 35 or 40 wells, clean water that was sunk into different communities up the lake shore. And um, it was always an absolute joy to see the children particularly enjoying that because, you know, you start to work for your family as soon as you can walk straight. And at five years old, you might be carrying buckets of water to your family. So, uh, or with a child on your, baby on your back even, your brother or sister so that it, it helps the entire family to bring in um, community change and development in, the, and in, in those ways. We also um, made a big um, emphasis on, on education and growth. And this, these are uh, leadership training programs in the church, but it, it spread beyond that. And, and the friendships that developed out of this, uh, I have, just a, a lovely story. It, it, there was at a time um, where we had, uh, as all families do, you sometimes have falling out. And uh, a certain priest in our diocese did not appreciate my leadership and got very angry and decided to leave the church to start his own. Uh, but he didn't have any support for that. So he tried to use some nefarious ways and of course, I clearly uh, was not a Mozambican citizen, although in fact, I had been offered uh, that, that gift. Um, but uh, I, as a foreigner, he thought he had uh, some power over me and so went to the government and tried to get me kicked out of the country. Um, he thought his plans would, would go better. And while this was happening, um, the person who came to give me support and then eventually to pray for me was the imam. Uh, he, because we had become friends through some uh, collective work together in the community. And he heard about this, uh, this per person and had heard uh, some of his attacks. And so came to me to offer his support and then ended up praying for me. Um, in the end, it, it was all resolved uh, in, a, in a good way, at least for me. Um, but that friendship uh, was a very moving and touching uh, part of, of our, our last few years in Mozambique. These here are community priests, which is a, something that we uh, developed during the time that we were there to, to cope with the, the growth of the church there. And um, there are two women amongst this group. Um, Albertina and Claudina, and they are the first two Mozambican women ordained into the Anglican church in Mozambique and lovely, lovely people. Um, I was told right at the very beginning when we went there that um, by our, the Dean of our, 
our cathedral, that there was no problem for them to have women ordained. It was the church that was putting up the blocks to it because they said in African traditional religion, it didn't matter the gender of the person who was praying for the community, praying for rain or, mm. or whatever. It didn't matter. It was whether the spirit of God was with them. And it was just really interesting, fascinating that by ordaining women, we were breaking down some of the barriers that the church had put there in the first place. And um, these, are, these are people that are working in their communities, are from their communities, um, already were in leadership of some sort in their churches, already leaders in their communities. And um, we had developed a three, a three year course where they would come in to Lushinga, stay for two or three weeks, and then go back with some homework. And the homework would be anything from starting a new church to baptism and marriage and, um, and, and working in community development. So they were all trained like our community development workers as well, which um, just made them very active. And like trainers of trainers was our, our uh, approach there that you might have had a seminary education, but you are working with people now and you need to pass on all that information. Yeah, our, our approach was this appreciative inquiry whereby um, you look for the, the natural resources, human and natural resources that exist, rather than trying to bring development in from outside, you develop from within. So whilst we've been over here, which is five years now, um, we've been sort of trying to understand this new life in our experiences that we've had. And these are different, four different things that we've, we've thought about. There are other things, but it seems as if being part of God's story is understood in a different way. Um, or was understood in a different way in Mozambique, in Northern Mozambique, which I think pulls back into African traditional religion and understanding, and that there is an expectancy that God is at work and God is going to work. And we're just part of, of what's, what's going on. And there is a humility amongst um, leadership and there that, that is striking. Um, that you allow space for others. Uh, one of the clearest ways of, sh of showing that is in a meeting where one by one you would all be given the opportunity to speak and you would might even say the same as the other person but everybody has spoken and then it's all gathered together into one. Whereas here you have a you might have a conversation, a meeting where everyone's talking over each other and, and it all comes out in the, in the mix at the end, but there's this sort of gentle um, listening for others to, and, and, and uh, I think we could only describe it as a humility of allowing the other. Um, it also um, um, has a much more collective idea of, of goodness, uh, the common good. I mean, it's just been fascinating to, to be back in the United States for me, to, for Helen the first time. And um, the, the importance of individualism, individual rights for us here, as compared to the common good for Mozambicans. And while each has some advantages and disadvantages, um, it, it would seem to me that we could learn something from uh, African communities about looking out for each other for the common good. It's something to do with being persons um, altogether that sits in the middle somewhere between even individualism and communitarianism. Um, because I do think there's on both ends of this, both sides of this, there's um, positive and negative. Um, being so community focused is not allowing for some people to actually uh, rise up sometimes, uh, improve their lives because you're taking the community with you. You know, there's a, 
in some of the research that's happened, they said for the average Western family, um, you include maybe five people. So the breadwinner is going to be looking after five people. In Mozambique, it's 22 people. And, and that just changes uh, dynamics as well. But it's, it's both sides, I think, have something to learn about what it is to be a person um, within those two ways of seeing things. And that we learned uh, always, everywhere, everyone, and this mutual learning, learning from each other. Helen uses this thing about leading from the middle, um, that you're always both a leader and a follower, depending on what role you're in. And, and this is uh, something that really was impressed upon us that, you know, yeah, I might have the uh, purple shirt and the collar. And yet, uh, in so many ways, I was learning, learning about culture, about language, about uh, ways of seeing things from uh, a Mozambican perspective, uh, where I was truly the student. And, and uh, that kind of giving uh, to each other in, in the learning process also increased this sense of mutual regard uh, for one another, not dependent on one's social status or educational position, but uh, really seeing our humanity in one another. Unfortunately, um, these cycles of violence, um, either through natural disasters or man-made um, uh, physical violence continue. And uh, once again, in Northern Mozambique, there has been uh, violence. I spoke to the Bishop three days ago. It's called uh, an is Islamic insurgency uh, from a group called uh, Ahlus Sunnah Wal Jamaa. Uh, somewhat linked with ISIS, perhaps, not really sure. But he, he told me, uh, and, and this is the different stories that one needs to really dig to find out. He told me, this is not about religion. It's the underlying uh, sense of discrimination that we described in our talk of uh, poverty, chronic poverty. And now uh, in Mozambique, there have been discovered huge natural gas fields off the coast. It is the third largest investment in Africa, uh, nearly $60 billion. And none of those proceeds seem to be uh, redirected into the communities, predominantly Muslim communities along the coast. And that sense of injustice that goes on year after year, decade after decade, uh, centuries now uh, is rising up and and uh, unfortunately uh, violence is occurring again with uh, 50 young men beheaded on a football pitch uh, only last week. Uh, so there's still so much to do as we try to find this sense of full ident identity back to the vision we had of uh, being a communion of communities uh, reaching across our differences as uh, the late Chief Rabbi Jonathan Sachs says, the dignity of our difference uh, can bring us together. So I think we'll end there. <laughs> Thanks uh, so very much for letting us share a little bit of our story of Mozambique. The um, experiences that you've had there of um, the poverty of the peoples there um, we experienced this in, in Kentucky, especially Eastern Kentucky. Um, are, are there, I don't know how strong those parallels might be, but what sorts of lessons might you bring back from Mozambique that apply here to Kentucky? I'm going to go. Yeah. This is something really on my heart at the moment. Well, it has been since we've been here, trying to see what our involvement could be um, in Appalachia. You remember we were in West Virginia for two years before we came here. So um, we've learned about the, the communities, even though we haven't lived in, in, in the mountains, we've lived in Charleston and here. But um, I would be really, really keen to hear the stories of the people that are living there. As soon as we talk, I have talked about whatever could be done in Appalachia, People say, oh, I know somebody at UK or I know somebody, you know, 
in Lexington or something. I think the stories have to come from, from people there. And um, that's, how, that's how I've learned about Mozambique was through sitting around with the women in their quintals, as we call it, around the, there's a, there's a phrase that is used that we're sitting around the, the household pot. So you're sitting there eating and talking and, and finding out about life from them. So you're starting from the grassroots instead of from another place. And I wondered if that wouldn't be something that needed to, to happen really. And I know that our churches, for example, we've got some churches in these areas as does West Virginia and other, other states. But I wonder if because they are on the, on the margins of their diocese, whether they truly get um, heard and um, if they are then um, encouraged to become part of the change there um, in, in, in some way. But it really, uh, in my mind, would start from listening. Yeah, and, 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 a, and a lesson we did learn from Mozambique, um, because we were, we were a poor church and so didn't have many res financial resources of our own, we often had to apply for grants and things through outside agencies. And they were always suspicious of faith communities because um, they were afraid we would proselytize as it would be, you know, Rice Christians kind of stories of getting people to join our tradition through development work. But what, what, what we learned over the years was that faith communities are the community. Unlike any other agency, if you look at not-for-profits or NGOs, whatever you want to call them, they're always outsiders who come in and do things. They, they hire leaders to, to do work and projects. But faith communities are the people of that place. And uh, they have stability. Um, and presence in a way that no other organization, it, it truly is a grassroots organization. And the importance in Eastern Kentucky of partnering, uh, partnerships, uh, the Episcopal Church is, has a very small presence, uh, others uh, a much more developed one. And so um, I have asked our Archdeacon Brian Kibler to put together a small group, as Helen said, to, to begin listening and looking for how we can partner in a different way. And it really is about being the church outside of the building. I also think it's, some, it's about looking for who are the community leaders. It may not be the priest. It, I used to say um, in our cathedral there, if you didn't have um, Monica Masosa on, on, if you hadn't got her voice in something, then it wasn't gonna go anywhere. You just had to have her, she was 80 years old, but you know, that, that's a community leader that people could look to and trusted. And it might not be who we think it's going to be. You know, when the first missionaries went as well, they went with the idea that you had to gather men together um, in order to start like a Bible study or a church or whatever it was, you know, gather, gather the men together. Um, but although it's broken down a lot, the area we were in was matrilineal. And that means you actually should get the women together they're the ones who, who um, have got social connection and social power. Um, I can talk about matrilinealism later, but it's just, it's, it's learning from where you are, uh, who are the community leaders and not presuming. Very good, thank you for that. Uh, some of the questions that have come in include, um, has the Portuguese government ever apologized for its role in enslaving the people of Mozambique? Uh, and they've asked or paid reparations. Um, has that idea come up in, in your experiences in Mozambique? No, not that I know of. Um, but I think even Mozambicans would say that um, um, Mozambican, uh, there was already slavery in Mozambique. Um, and that's what Mark was saying with Arab traders that, that they were connecting into different tribes that were part of this whole system already. So um, yeah. 
it's it's a compl it's another complicated history. Um, I don't know what, what has Portugal done to. I, I don't believe there has been any talk of reparations, although uh, there has been there there is a new. Uh, set of initiatives by the Portuguese government to invest in Mozambique and Angola, places where they were colonial powers. But I think like many colonizers, <laughs> it's, it's been a really difficult story to, to accept and um, to speak into. And, and it includes the church as well, because um, Often uh, the, the church in, in Mozambique, it happened to be that it was the Roman Catholic Church with the state in, um, in British uh, colonies, it was the Anglican Church. And so we happened to be not the church of power. And so we had a, a different voice, but when the church aligns itself with power uh, or any faith tradition, um, then it can be a very dangerous a very dangerous relationship. Um, so yeah, it's, as Helen said, it has been very complicated. I don't think most Mozambicans uh, dwell on the transatlantic slavery issue as much as more recent uh, violence uh, from the war for independence and the, uh, the war of destabilization. Those are the things that are in people's memories. There is something to know about the UMCA, the, the mission group that, that went out, the Anglican mission group that went out, in that when they all died, the team died, you know, very shortly after 1961 when they first went, they went off to Zanzibar, the island of Zanzibar. Maybe you already know that, but there was a cathedral that was planted on top of the slave selling market as a way of, of speaking directly to to um, select, they wanted to go to Zanzibar because it was the slave selling area, uh, island for Eastern Africa. And they, they, they have made that. There's some really awful um, statues that are there about that market underneath that cathedral. But the symbolism of it was, was important and is important even now to, um, I think the Archbishop of Canterbury and various others, they make that a place of almost pilgrimage now mm. on the island of Zanzibar. Very What's it? Oh. Yeah. Is he gonna uh, let, me, let me pass along uh, some of these other questions. Um, in the uh, picture at the, uh, uh, in your church, uh, the girls were wearing uniforms and the boys were not. Is, is that uh, typical or was that just that day or what was going on? Which was that? The, the um, Meninas. Yeah. Oh, they oh, love Santi, I think. Santi Neige. That's just, that's um, a little group, uh, a, a girls group called Santi Neige, St. Agnes, which um, it's for girls between the age of six and 16. And it's a bit like the guides. Do you have that? Here. Girl Scouts. Girl Scouts. Okay. Yes, they have a uniform like like the Girl Scouts do, you know, and they dress in their uniform. That was Palm Sunday, so they are in uniforms and they're part of the actual liturgy. Yeah. And, oh. and we didn't. We, it's true, we did not have a, a boys equivalent. No. It was hard. It was easier to get boys to play soccer than it was to join his groups. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, why are evangelical churches more successful in Africa than um, liberal denominations? Would you agree with that assessment? I don't know if that's true. No, I don't okay. know if that's true. No. Um, Depends what you mean by success. Yeah, okay. I mean, I guess, I mean, where the, the Episcopal Church is part of the Anglican Communion. And the, so the Anglican churches of Africa are growing enormously fast. Now, they would tend to be uh, more conservative than we are here. Um, and, I, and I often, I've, I've thought a lot about that too, uh, how culture impacts um, religion and, and our religion impacts our culture and that, that back and forth movement there. 
but uh, the, the, what we call the mainline churches here in the United States are growing rapidly in Africa. Um, now, and, and, and Anglicans being one of them, but not only. Uh, the, the Roman Catholic Church is growing, Presbyterian, Methodist, uh, everywhere. I don't think you could call the high church Anglicanism of Southern Africa and Mozambique conservative. If you're thinking church religious wise, yes, it's biblically based. A lot of people, it may be the only book they have in their, in their house would be a Bible. And I said to someone the other day, I would be cautious about going to a Bible study unprepared because many Mozambicans know the Bible like the back of their hand, <laughs> you know. Um, but if it's to do with um, community development and work, it depends how you use those two words. And over yeah. here, it's being party politicized more than it would be there. Or, or single issues. Yeah, but, but Southern Africa, AXA is not um, a single, uh, it's not conservative or liberal, it's more liberal than it, most others in, in the continent of Africa, but there's still that, trying to find that middle way, which is Anglicanism, um, between different parts. Um, and I think they've taken the best, they've, they've tried to pull on the best. Yeah. I think you could uh, call it progressive. Progressive, yeah. I think, I mean, the way, the way churches are involved in the entire life uh, development of communities is a very progressive uh, posture, I think. Mm. Um. Another question, uh, looking at the Mozambique flag that you displayed at one point, there were uh, two symbols especially that stood out. One was, uh, do we know what the book is that's represented? And why is there an AK-47 on the flag? Um, I, I believe the, the, uh, the gun has been removed <laughs> in a new version, but uh, that was to, the, the struggle for independence was such an important, as Helen mentioned, nation forming process. Because prior to that, I remember 500 years, Mozambique was a colony of a European power, 500 years. Yeah. And, and the boundary that became Mozambique is absolutely artificial, drawn by the European powers. So the people's of Mozambique were never a nation. Uh, they, were, they were people, Yao, Nyanjas, Makuas, Kimwanis. They, they were peoples, uh, nation states like the Scots, the Irish, and the English, uh, just as different as, as that. And the European powers made them into countries on maps, but they had no identity. And so the war for independence was kind of a, a crystallizing moment to bring a sense of identity as we are Mozambicans. Um, and, and that's, so post-independence, that's been a real challenge because it's, it's easier when you have a common enemy to be united and it becomes more complicated as you start looking forward about how to share power and hear everyone's voice. And this is where some of those differences have, have risen and uh, cause some strain. So that's why the gun is there. The book is just a book. It's not the Bible, because in fact, Frilimo, when they took power, uh, actually told churches they had no longer had any role. Um, even though many of them, as I said, fought for independence, when they first took power, they said the church no longer has a role. The bishop that I told you about, who was imprisoned by the Portuguese for 10 years for trying to uh, help the struggle, was also imprisoned by the new Mozambican government because he refused to ask for a travel permit when he was going to visit his churches. And he told them, I know exactly what this jail looks like. I've been here before. If you want to put me there, I'm happy to go back. Uh, and they let him go on his way and, and, and visit his community. So there has been a, there was a great deal of tension up to the death of Samora Michel, who died uh, mysteriously in an airplane crash uh, flying over South Africa, uh, never, never discovered what had happened. And, 
and then uh, relationships began to fall out between the churches, religious communities, and the state. So one of the questions I typed in the uh, chat is, is religious imagery prominently, prominently displayed in the churches in, in uh, Mozambique? And if so, what race are they portrayed? Whoa. Whoa. Yeah, the, the, there's very little um, in our churches um, except for the Stations of the Cross, which is a traditional Anglo-Catholic um, reverence around uh, Holy Week, and 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 those um, are often African figures. So they're they're dressed in African robes uh, with dark faces and African features. Or they're symbolic. There's some symbol put on there, like the sloping cross or something. But it's an interesting question. I know where you're coming from. <laughs> Years ago, um, I was sent a whole load of pictures of Christ on the cross that USPG, a mission society in, in London, um, had put together. And they were from around the world, and they'd done pictures with Christ of the people from that, you know, like a Japanese or a Chinese uh, man or um, African man or woman. There was one with a woman on it, you know. And um, I stuck these around the church that I was working in at that time. And I said, which of these really appeals to you? And do you know where they all went? You can guess. Mm -hmm. They went to the white Jesus with all the fluffy little animals around them. Yeah. So yes, there is a problem in that people have been presented with um, blue the blue eyed soft, soft eyed Jesus and um it's a it's 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 something to work with move along with <laughs> but okay. until i had some wonderful um bible teaching um posters that did the entire bible that you also stuck on the wall and you could go around and it was all african tribe tribal people from around africa and basically you were asked to look at it and you'd see the pictures of um all of the books of the bible were there and the spirit moving through all of them. And it was just, it was lovely to teach with that. So I'd, I think it's a recognized issue and I think it's being attended to, but you need to make sure that the clergy are trained into thinking mm -hmm. that as well. I think that's something that seminary education has to really look at. Yeah. And, but I think the tribe. <laughs> and, and that's, that's this, um, this mixture of the colonialization, which not only was it an, an oppressive government, but also um, a way of thinking that that put white privilege above uh, everything else in 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 the mindset of people themselves. And so I remember uh, after uh, getting to know some people really well, them saying, "We are independent." of Portugal, but we are not yet free mm -hmm. because this way of thinking was still so much a part of their culture. Colonialism of the mind. As yeah. I think it was Ngugi that wrote that. I'm not dead sure, but it was, it's a few decades ago that he wrote about that, that it's, if it's in the mind. And I just said this last week or the week before from my pulpit, I was trying to explain um, something and I said you know there's one thing that I always found absolutely horrific that and I did it horrified me and I used to tell people don't do that don't do that but they said Mama Elena we can't do that rubbing our skin I mean I've never seen anyone here do I mean it's just yes you can and that was one of the positives that came out of building that church <clears throat> yes you can and seeing some of the some of the attitudes particularly amongst women who are you know they've got multiple um issues pulling them down but to rub your skin was just something i found painful, painful horrific <laughs> but that's that colonialism of the mind and what they've been brought up with there are women that have explained to me they've never had an education because their parents didn't didn't send them to school they, you know they didn't want them to learn a new way or um they needed them to work in the field so there's there's a whole there's multiple um issues to be addressed. And we're talking about rural Africa and often rural Africa doesn't have the voices heard, even in 
um, urban Africa. So you'll, you'll get wonderful theological treaties coming you know, from writers in South Africa, but it's, it, although it's, it's uh, coming from the Anglican Church of Southern Africa, that is not the voice of rural Africa, rural Mozambique, rural Mozambique as well. But because the, the national language is Portuguese, that limits the, the people that can hear from them. And then um, the multiple languages that are there. And then that's where this chronic poverty comes from too. There's just too many layers to get through. Could I ask a question, please? Um, I had a friend uh, from Nigeria who is a Christian now, but I can remember uh, his telling me that when the uh, missionaries came over, supposedly to help them with their agriculture, that uh, Christianity was pushed much more than education. And my question to you is why, um, why I guess would anyone impose their religion on another group simply because they don't believe as you do? If the purpose is to educate them agriculturally, why not stick to that focus instead of trying to recruit or demand that they become Christians as well? You can answer yeah. that, Bishop. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, I, I, there's two parts. The, the first part is to kind of, a sad story mm -hmm. that I, we said how Muslims and Christians live side by side for 150 years in Mozambique. And then in the last 20 years, tensions have risen. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the reason that's happened is that more fundamentalist teaching from both uh, faith traditions has come into the country. And uh, young leaders are being sent out uh, to, to places where the teaching uh, speaks about difference rather than unity. And the result of that has been increased tension between Christians and Muslims across Northern Mozambique. Uh, but all, all influence from outside, not from inside. So a more direct answer to your question as, as a Christian, uh, when, we, when we started to work um, with communities our primary focus in the in the area of development was what we were doing. So it was either literacy or fresh water or healthcare or agriculture. That was our purpose and everyone uh, could participate. But we also were um, more than willing to share the reason for our hope. Um, and and if, if people wanted to learn more about it, um, we were, we were we are more than willing to share. And what happened was um, people were often very interested uh, because they wanted to understand what was the motivation for you to come to work here. And, and I'm speaking about us as the church, not us two Mazungus uh, sitting in front of you, but Mubus. Mozambicans who, who, who were, were doing these work in communities. Why are you here? Why are you doing this for someone who's not your family member or, or kin, kinship? And, and that question was enough to start a conversation. And, and so the, if evangelism happened, and it did, it happened through conversation and relationship, not imposition <coughs> or uh, requiring them to sign something in order to participate in a project. I think the history of... Um mission work in Africa is going to bring in <clears throat> sorts of questions that we won't, we won't agree with now. Mm -hmm. um, and there were many missionaries that came after the wars, there were more missionaries that came as Australians coming in and um, Americans um, that might be more conservative and there to preach the gospel to and, change and to change people and they did not work with established churches they came to start their own churches and to me that was like going back to the beginning again but the umca and and then um the way the anglican church has been and i can quote archbishop tutu on this is they came um um 
and establish schools and health centers um, alongside true, alongside church or whatever, but it was for the communities. And Archbishop Tutu has publicly thanked those mission societies for coming and um, bringing that opportunity, which the colonial governments weren't doing um, to um, Africa. And there are all sorts of questions over that and everything. But another thing for Mozambique, it was a little bit different um, in that it wasn't the Anglican church that colonialized. It, it was the Catholic church because it was a Portuguese colony. I can't say the same for South Africa there. Of course, it was the British government that colonized. It just gave it a different history. And um, in, in, in Mozambique, the Anglican church was not the colonizers. And that had you a different relationship. The, those missionaries that, that we knew personally, actually some who'd been there and had returned to Britain, they learned the local languages when they went there. They didn't learn Portuguese until the Portuguese government said, you've got to go back to Portugal and learn that. But the idea was, well, the idea, they were not the colonizers. They were not the government overseeing. They were, they were seen more as the protectors, I think, of traditional culture. So you can't blanket statement with many things. Africa's just massive and the history there has been just such a range of everything um, that we have a localized ex ex uh, experience of. Mm. Thank yeah. you. Hi. Hello. Yeah. Uh, this is Muriel Nasser and I'm from Zanzibar. Hey. Uh, <laughs> Three, three generation uh, from Zanzibar. And uh, I just seeing you, you know, brings a lot of uh, memories of our schoolings and you know, the British Raj. Mm. Um, but uh, after revolution in Zanzibar, when we went to Tanganyika at that time, uh, we were 18 of us under 16 years old, um, my cousins and uh, my siblings, and we were out of school in Zanzibar for a while, and we ended up going to Arusha and Moshi, the uh, hill of Mount Kilimanjaro. And we wore our Zanzibar uniform, which was very uh, British uniform, uh, looking for admission in some of the schools. And we were in Moshi, and uh, this was an Anglican school, and they wouldn't give us admission because we were Muslims. Mm. Whoa. Yes, this is 1964. Mm. So we were left without school for about two years till we started uh, moving westwards. Some of us went eastwards, you know, wherever we could get admissions. And talking about the Anglican church in Zanzibar on the slave uh, market, uh, we were taken there as, on a field trip from schools. Uh, at that time, it wasn't mentioned as a slave uh, area, though. Mm. It was just for, for one, one of the landmarks of Zanzibar. Mm. And it's st still there, and my brother still writes books on Zanzibar and colonization. Uh, so, so anyway, some of our teachers, you remind us of some of my teachers back in Zanzibar. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Good to see you. Good to hear about your you. experience in Mozambique. My, na my name is Richard Mitchell. I'm a Quaker and uh, I have a little bit of knowledge and that may be dangerous. Uh, my wife and I, oh, maybe 10 years ago, were in South Africa and we're struck by just how little power uh, that black South African women had. Um, and maybe I jumped to a quick co conclusion. It wasn't true uh, that I knew in other parts of Af Africa where Quakers had been missionaries that a now uh, African run uh, Quakerism is also very patriarchal and the churches are very patriarchal. And so when I listen to you, 
uh, well, my, my conclusion was that they were bring, they brought a pra patriarchal religion to a patriarchal society, but it sounds like Mo Mozambique, the society wasn't as patriarchal to begin with. Am, am I hearing right? Um, Northern Mozambique, not the whole of Mozambique, Northern Mozambique and a swathe going into Zambia and that historically, um, and I'm saying that it's it's altered since that that with all the the, the history of the last hundred years, uh, historically is matriarchal, which means matrilineal. that matrilineal, sorry, matrilineal, which means that the children go into the mother's line, not the father's line. And um, I noticed a difference in the war from working in the middle of Mozambique, which was not matrilineal, to then going north about. Even in absolute poverty, um, there was something of a dignity about women, the way women carried themselves, to be honest, that I, that was one thing I, that struck me and um, tried to find out about later. And it, it just very subtly changes everything when the children belong to the mother's line. It means that men will leave more easily under poverty because they're not their kids. Um, it means she can go her in, in the south of Mozambique, they've got a uh, Lobola, which is um, the bride price that's arranged for you to marry the woman. That's patri that's patrilineal. In the north, it's not like that. You don't have Lobola and it changes the relationships very subtly. So the person who might make decisions for your family in the north is actually the brother of the, of the mother, the uncle. So it's still a man. So it is a well. It's the mother's. It's the mother's line. It's just interesting those subtle little changes to what it's done. I I often used to remark that the men had seemed to have left under poverty. The men leave at the drop of a hat, you know, and <laughs> and or you know they'd go off and find employment in a neighboring country and not come back. Um, wasn't the yeah very subtly different. Fascinating. Thank you very it much. It is. I'd like to uh, just, I guess, ask kind of a question or maybe a comment both, but I really personally have enjoyed this. It's been very impactful to me. And your comment about where everyone would speak and be listened to and that being important and not speaking over each other. I mean, that is so important. We could learn so much from that. And, and the other point about a community, you know, taking a community and that having a voice, we can learn so much from that. So that's just two of a of hundred things mentioned today that I really found important. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. One of the yes. other questions that I'm sorry, I'll I'll step aside. Go ahead and talk. Um, I I can't get in on video, and I notice that that's true for a lot of other people too. This is Ann Jane Wilson. I just want to say that um, a couple of things. Um, one is that having lived in Sierra Leone and Liberia and Ghana, um, why I think that it's important to emphasize what they have said about Muslims and Christians, because in all three of those countries, we lived two years in, in Sierra Leone, two years in Liberia. I was a Fulbright scholar in um, Ghana. Uh, we had, it was, it was as common in some ways for a Muslim to marry a Christian as it would have it, uh, as it is now in this country for Catholics to marry Protestants. And so it was a very different kind of situation. And um, we, were, uh, I we were Peace Corps with Peace Corps in uh, Liberia and Sierra Leone. That is not true today for the same reasons that you all have talked about in Mozambique because there are more conservative uh, Christian groups and more conservative Muslim groups. Thank you. 
Well, and then there's also natural resources um, that has, you know, environmental damage and things like that in the last couple of decades. Because during war, people didn't come in and take trees out of Mozambique. <laughs> it's been since war that, you know, there's there's just been so much that's been taken out. So it, it, you can't just say any, any um, it isn't just about religion. So the, Chinese government, the Chinese have been in and taken out trees from Mozambique by the millions. millions. And they do none of the tertiary work, you know, they cut them down and take them with, with everything. None of the other work is done by Mozambicans even before it's taken out. And they'd rather pay the fines to take it. So there's, there's real environmental damage being done through commercial interests globalization globalization <laughs> i suppose but also the chinese um understanding of life that it's all there for the taking <laughs> you know um it isn't just about religion it is, isn't just about there's so many layers to to the state of what it is for rural africa now so many layers and and um i've been reading um some stuff recently because of of extremist uh, organizations and and the it's not because of unemployment and poverty per se it, that that's not the, the the tipping point it's it's more about a deprivation discrimination and <laughs> Addison, I think we need to ask people to um, undo their video. He's, it's uh, too much. Are we break oh. up. Bandwidth. Yeah. Uh, Bishop, it's you were so just easy. cutting out on us. Um, we're uh, cutting back on some of the video feeds coming in. So just turn those on if you uh, have a question. Um, we've got time. We've got five more minutes. Um, so any more questions uh, are welcome at this point. I don't really have a quick question, but I, I, I want you to know how much I admire your commitment and dedication to your mission. That's, that's really inspiring. And I want to thank you for raising the issue of individual rights and, and that and common concerns or common rights and mm -hmm. achieve that balance. I, I think that's uh, something we have to look to our religions to do. And I don't think we've done enough of it and that imbalance. It's one of the biggest problems I see, you know. So, kind of make a made a sacred cow out of individual rights in this country. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, but I've seen other people come here, and their responsibility to back home is so great that they can't really make any progress here for for, yeah. for that for that burden. So I, I appreciate that, and I and I recognize that as, that is something we really have to uh, answer. I think particularly seeking guidance from our religious perspectives yeah thank you so much thank you thank you i saw a question earlier that was written in about covid19 and what's happening in mozambique well the um the numbers are extremely low of people either being positive and like in the handful uh, registered as dying from COVID-19. But on one side, I'm thinking, how would they really know? Um, because I'm sure that the testing isn't anything like what we're having here. And um, so I don't, I, I don't know that. But I do know that the Anglican Church in Northern Mozambique, what they're actually doing to help that is all the absolute communal things, like making sure people have got soap and um, food if they're sick. They, they're ready. They're ready to help with cleaning things, and but the the statistics haven't really. Um, they've just made people panic when they've heard about what's happening over here because we 
you know, I, I get Mozambicans asking me how I am because I'm in this country, you know, <laughs> um, but it's just not happening there. And so there's big questions about that. Um, but as I said, my question is, how would you really know with the statistics, you know, but. Yeah. Many of you have, oh, go ahead. Okay, um, yeah, I um, have, I'm a language person. And uh, throughout your presentation, you use words like Mashamba and Mzungu and, and so forth. And I'm wondering, could you tell me how widely spoken is Kiswahili in Mozambique? Is it just certain regions? Um, and then also, um, what percentage of Mozambicans speak Portuguese fluently? The, the language of education right from preschool up is in Portuguese. So if you've been to any level of education and there's a huge dropout rate, um, especially amongst girls, uh, then you've got a smattering of Portuguese. We used to think that people spoke better Portuguese in, in Mozambique than um, people in Malawi, for, which was where we went for a weekend away. The, 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 they spoke um, better Portuguese amongst Mozambicans than English was spoken in Malawi amongst Malawians. So it, it, it is widely spoken, um, but there are so many other local languages, so it gets sort of mixed up with local terms as well. And um, I know somewhere around two, when we went, when Mark was, was the bishop, we went out in 2002 and somebody said then only 12% of the population spoke only Portuguese in their lives. Most people will speak several languages. Yeah, and uh, Kiswahili is only spoken along the border with Tanzania, so a very small area. Um, but a good example of, of language is in our diocese, the prayer book was translated into eight languages and 95% of our worship was not in Portuguese, but in the Mozambican languages. So people prefer, the, the heart language is their mother tongue, and that is not Portuguese for most people. Um, but it's, it's the only unifying language, ironically, the colonial language is the only language people have in common. Um, and so that's why it became the language of the nation, of the state, because it's the only language understood by all. Um, but it did mean that many were discriminated against because they were not fluent Portuguese speakers, and again, primarily women. And also they only started teaching English in schools, I think it was in 2006, as a subject which sounds okay, but when you think that to go to further education, you might go to your neighboring countries and they all speak English or for business, you've got business links in other neighboring countries, you need that English. So it's complicated. <laughs> you said that before. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. Very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. And with that, I am going to uh, thank our guest today, Bishop Mark Vancouvering, his wife, Helen. And uh, thank you so much for a really um, educational uh, and uh, heartwarming and heartrending at times um, presentation. Um, I do want to invite people to uh, join us again. This is our last presentation for this fall. And we will resume January 23rd. Rabbi David Wurtschafter will be joining us um, for a presentation on social justice. We have uh, some fascinating programs lined up for the spring. I hope you will join us again. Sign up for uh, the email blast on our website. And uh, uh, that will be cmdlex.org. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Bishop. Thank you, Helen. And we will look forward to having you again in our uh, uh, online events. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.